Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, as Fernando said, my name is Ryan, and I have been a missionary uh, with a simple house for five years. Um, and a simple house is a Catholic ministry, and we're also a nonprofit organization that's made up of lay people. And we started eight years ago um, as sort of uh, an experiment in Christianity, and the idea was to take the gospel literally in two ways. And the first way was to go out two by two to meet and befriend the poor in their own homes and neighborhoods, um, and to spread the good news by doing that. And then the second way was to have a place where we could personally answer the invitation to the rich young man, uh, to leave everything, to follow God uh, in simplicity and in poverty. And so at Simple House, we depend uh, totally on donations and uh, we're trying to have a sort of an obvious reliance on God's providence. Um, and personally, after college, uh, I, I just felt the call to serve the poor and to live a very basic sort of Christian life um, that was just like prayer and good works. Get to know Jesus, get to know the poor. Um, something that was really simple. And I had volunteered with a few other organizations that gave out food or gave out clothes or did some sort of hospitality or met very basic needs and necessities. And I always felt that um, the poor, and especially like the poor in America, really needed something more than basic necessities. Um, that there was like a much deeper need there. And so I got hooked up with a simple house, partially through my wife, Laura, who's here. Uh, and I learned that one of the places where there's like this deeper need for something beyond material goods is uh, among families living on public assistance or on welfare in the inner city and especially in project neighborhoods. And um, so that's uh, part of where the, the mission of Simple House is, is to go into project neighborhoods and help people and love them and befriend them, um, and especially in places where there's just no one else going, you know. Um, and there is a unique problem in the inner city in America, and there's a unique problem in Southeast D.C., and the problem is that in these neighborhoods, there's a lot of places that are offering these basic material necessity uh, type things. You know, uh, there's the Salvation Army, there's a lot of places where you can get food and clothes and shelter um, and all sorts of different help. And then you look around in the project neighborhoods and in uh, a lot of the um, these neighborhoods and there's still crime and there's still drug abuse and there's still neglect and there's still um, children who uh, need help and need better education. There's still gang violence. There's still still all these problems, you know. And so it kind of gives you a clue that there's something deeper. Uh, there's something else besides uh, material needs. And this is because uh, there is a spiritual poverty that is related to a material poverty. And the spiritual poverty is a lack of hope, it's a lack of purpose, a lack of meaning, um, a lack of love that uh, can be so strong in many cases that it can actually lead to a cycle of self-defeating behavior. It can you know, lead to bad choices. You start to fill this deep need for meaning and love with all these different other things and it sort of compounds these initial problems that you have where, where once it was um, just like you didn't make enough, well now you've got this addiction that also sucks away, uh, you know, your monthly money to this other thing. And so, so these needs get compounded. And Mother Teresa called spiritual poverty the problem of the poor in America. Um, overall, other problems, spiritual poverty was the problem of the poor in America. And so, uh, what this looks like in the people that we meet in, in our ministry is that, for example, there's one woman who knows very well that her family's well-being depends on various errands that she needs to run. Uh, she knows that she needs to enroll this child in school, she can go down to this food pantry to get food, um, and she can do a number of other things and go pick up diapers or this sort of thing. Um, but all the problems in her life weigh so heavily on her heart and on her mind, the trouble her kids are getting into, the mess that they bring into the house, all these things, that she sleeps until 3 p.m. And then when she gets up, she kind of checks out and watches TV for the rest of the day. And so, uh, so it's really hard to get motivated. It's really hard to get out of bed. It's really hard to get out of the house. 
and the problems compound. compound. Um, another example would be that a lot of boys that we know who are 10 and 12 years old steal cars just because it's fun to steal cars. You know, they're not trying to sell them for parts or anything. Um, but no one's watching them, and they skip school and go steal cars. And um, a lot of times, you know, these boys get locked up and don't finish high school. And so then there's this whole other problem, you know, so the problems compound. Um, or uh, a couple weeks ago, I spent most of, um, most of the day just sort of um, just sitting in the hospital with a, with a man who was trying to enter a detox program. And he'd actually tried to enter this program twice before on his own. But he got to the hospital and he got so scared uh, because they had to admit him to the psych ward um, that he just left. You know, both times he just up and left. He just couldn't take it. And so really he just needed somebody to sit with him, to encourage him, to tell him it was going to be okay, to walk him through the process, um, to do what he already knew he needed to do, what he already wanted to do. So, um, in all these situations, love is really the greatest need, and we face and encounter a lot of these problems in the inner city that um, will actually never be fully solved by material solutions. And so just as material poverty and spiritual poverty are connected, um, there also needs to be like a spiritual help for the poor, as well as a material help for the poor. And so, uh, at Simple House, some of the things our missionaries are trying to do is um, visit and pray with the sick and with the elderly, uh, provide groceries at the end of the month for families. Um, when they run out of food stamps, we um, help mothers visit their sons in jail. Um, we especially try to support uh, a lot of single mothers with diapers and um, things that they need, and especially the encouragement to make loving choices uh, when the time comes for those things. And we take families to Mass on Sunday. Um, and we've even... Um, had the, the great grace to be godparents and sponsors and catechists of about 17 uh, people who've received the sacraments in the last few years. Um, and so, beyond all of this, we're sort of, uh, the way to, to meet the spiritual poverty, the, the material and the spiritual need, um, is with loving and authentic friendships. Um, it's a very natural context within which to spread the good news and share the faith. And it's also the way to like meet a person's real need. You know, uh, very often a person doesn't even know what they need, but they've got this whole mess of problems in their life. Um, and with a relationship, as you get to know them, uh, these things start to come up, and especially as trust builds. Um, and so, whenever whenever I talk, I want to encourage other Christians to help and befriend, and love and give to the poor, because if spiritual poverty is the major problem in the inner city in America, Christians are specially equipped to meet it. Um, and that's because we have the gifts of faith and hope and love, uh, and particularly faith, and that's particularly um, what I'd like to touch on for the rest of my talk. And right now, we, in our kind of public discourse, have this uh, dialogue going on about whose responsibility it is to help the poor. And some people say it's the poor's responsibility, and some people say it's the government's responsibility, and there's a lot of people talking about how it's other person's responsibility. But Christians have a special responsibility. And Christians have something that the poor uh, need, and Christians have something that the world and the government can't give to the poor. Christians can give to the poor a hope that is grounded in the reality of God's love. Christians can help somebody make God's love come alive and become real in somebody's life. Um, one way that we know that God truly loves us, you know, is that we have, like, good people in our life that loves us. You know, this is very, uh, it's very important. And a person that thinks no one loves them can't believe that God loves them. It's very difficult. It's almost impossible. Because they think themselves unlovable. So the love of one person can change that. Um, Christians can also give to the poor a love that's rooted in their dignity. That's just uh, simply, I love you because you exist. Um, whereas a lot of agencies or organizations or these things have qualifications and standards that you need to meet. Or 
different ways that you merit help. But a Christian's love can be free. Uh, a Christian, Christian can show some, someone real friendship, which is displayed in personal sacrifice. Um, personal sacrifice is pretty uncommon in a world, and especially like in the hood, it's kind of a dog-eat-dog, -dog, every-man-for-himself type of environment. And sacrifice and selflessness uh, can go a long way. It can be a pretty powerful testimony. And uh, finally, a Christian can lead someone to ulti ultimate fulfillment because they can lead them to a relationship with God. But all these things, all these awesome benefits, all these awesome ways that we can help and love the poor are only possible when we put our faith into action. And uh, one thing at Simple House that motivates us is the realization that if I show up to somebody's house and spend a half hour with them, their life is not going to be changed. You know, nobody's life is going to be changed by just meeting me. But if, when I visit them, they're introduced to Jesus, well, then there you've got something. You know, uh, it, if, uh, if they're meeting Jesus when, when they come to me, then, then there's all sorts of possibilities. Uh, but, but I've got to use my faith to get to know Jesus personally and, and then step out there and let my faith work in my life, let it work in my relationships. Um, so that's an important part of love for the poor. And I think that love for the poor is tied to the faith of the believer in three major ways. Love for the poor is an act of faith. Love for the poor is a test of faith. And love for the poor builds faith. Um, love for the poor is an act of faith uh, simply because when we go to the poor, we believe that we're actually meeting Jesus. We're actually encountering Jesus. Um, and in, in the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, you know, whatever you have done for the least of these, you've done for me. And Mother Teresa and many saints have taken this so far to mean that, well, if I meet this poor man, I mean, this is Christ in his distressing disguise, in a way, you know. And so there's this encounter that, again, it's easy to forget in sort of an atmosphere of, how do we help the poor? It's about cost. It's about resources and allocation and programs and these sorts of things. But for the Christian, it's much, much more personal than that. It's an invitation to meet your God. It's an invitation to meet your Savior. You know, um, It's a life-giving invitation. We know a woman and her family, and we've known them for about eight years, uh, and I'll call her Alice for the sake of the story. And they live in like a three-bedroom apartment, and... Alice has a lot of children and a lot of grandchildren to feed and take care of. Uh, but nonetheless, she often takes in a lot of other homeless children, um, children that find themselves on the street, or young men uh, that are on the street after they get out from jail and have no place else to go. So her house is always really busy. She's got about, you know, a million grandchildren, <laughs> like all these other kids that are coming by. And um, I showed up with another volunteer on a Sunday afternoon to visit her one time. And we knocked on the door, and she came, and she opened it with a big smile, and she said, Oh, you're just in time for dinner. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and she opens the door, and she ushers us in, and she kind of pushes us down the hallway and past the kitchen where you can smell all this delicious food, and she sits us down in the living room, because there's no dining room, and she brings us out each a plate of fried chicken and collard greens and sweet potatoes, and it's delicious, you know. And uh, then she serves the children, and they come into the living room, and then the adults get their plates and they come into the living room. And we're all like eating on the floor and on the couch, and some people are sitting on this other table that's over here, and it's and we're kind of all sitting together. And it was the uh, friendliest, most loving uh, interaction I'd had with her in the four years that I'd known her until that time. But um, her uh, generous display also sort of embarrassed me, you know, um, because I'm the one that comes to brings food, you know. Uh, and so I was, like, profusely thanking her as as we were leaving. Oh, you know, you didn't have to do this. This was so good. Oh, you really didn't have to. I know. Blah, 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 blah. And um, she straight told me to shut up. <laughs> you know? And she was like, well, you know, you feed us. Let me feed you for once, you know. Um, let me do something for you, you know. And, um, 
Alice has got her problems. Uh, she's certainly got these things that are happening in her life. But on this occasion, she showed me a really nice, important feature of Jesus, Jesus' personality, how God loves us. Um, because, you know, in his poverty, he was abundantly generous too. So, when we go to the poor, if we believe we're going to meet Jesus, uh, we're going to look past these kind of things that we like to see, and Jesus is going to going to show us himself. And he never fails to show us himself if we go with this act of faith. Um, love for the poor, and the second point, is a test of faith. And there's two ways that love for the poor can be a test of faith. The first way is sort of a simple, well, do you walk the walk? You know, um, St. John challenges us in his letter, how can you say that you love a God that you don't see if you don't love all these brothers in need that you do see? Do you walk the walk? Are you, do you put your love for God in action by the way that you treat the poorest, the least, the lowest among you? Or do your actions match your words? <clears throat> um, Laura and I were talking about this the other day, and it's kind of like this scenario. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in a scenario like this at a party. But this happens to me a lot. <laughs> you're at a party, you're making small talk, you're trying to find something in common with strangers, and you meet this one person and you're talking, and you find that they have a hobby like hiking. And you say, without missing a beat, oh, I love hiking. And the person says, oh, where do you like to go hiking? And then you know that they've got you. <laughs> because you don't actually go hiking. <laughs> The last time you went hiking was like three years ago. And it was in the woods behind your parents' house, you know. <laughs> and so you say, oh, you know, here and there. Uh, you know, so it turns out you don't actually love hiking. You love the idea of hiking. Um, you wouldn't turn him down if he invited you hiking. But you're not like an outdoorsman, right? You're not a lover of the great outdoors. Um, and it's similar with the poor, you know. Uh, love for the poor is really, in many ways, where our rubber meets the road for, for the Christian life, for our walk of faith, you know? Uh, does our faith mean so much to us that we're getting out there uh, and we're ministering to other people? Are we meeting the needs of the poor, of the people around us? <clears throat> I'm going to tell this story um, that involved Laura um, and someone that we serve, and she gave me permission to tell it, so uh, if she's embarrassed, it's okay. So... Um, <laughs> So we met, or she and the founder of Simple House met this woman um, named Donna uh, a number of years ago, near the beginning of the ministry. And Donna, when they met her, was uh, sick nearly to the point of death. Her eyes were bulging out. She was in very bad shape. She'd even stopped paying her bills because she just expected that it wasn't going to be much longer. And so they would visit her, encourage her, spend time with her, bring her food, bring her like delicious food, like Popeye's fried chicken, which she loves. And um, she eventually recovered. Sometime later, she stole my father-in-law's credit card and went on a sp spending spree at Target with her children. And this soured the relationship, as you can tell. <laughs> so, um, for a couple years, we hardly spoke to her. Then she started calling again, and we sort of reconciled, and it was sort of like one of those over-the-phone reconciliations, you know, that you have, where it's like, okay, it's okay, um, I'll come visit you. And, but she's very demanding. And she would call up, and she was so rude, and she'd say, where's my fried chicken? Where's my Popeyes? Don't you have anything for me? Can't you bring me anything? And it's like she'd call you up and curse at you and give you a guilt trip, and you're just like, man, I don't want to go help this person. This is terrible. Um, but sometimes we'd get over ourselves and bring some furniture or bring something that we had by or bring some clothes. But much to our dismay, this would really just fuel further demands and make things much worse. Um, and so we had all but given up on the possibility of this becoming a nice relationship. But one day... Laura and a seminarian that was doing uh, ministry with us went and visited her. And out of the blue, 
she asked for a weekly Bible study. And Laura did not want to do this, <laughs> but how can you say no, you know? And after these weekly Bible studies, you know, um, which didn't really happen weekly, but they were happening pretty often, um, she became kinder. She stopped uh, harassing us on the phone. She started getting out of bed before noon uh, to get up for the Bible study. You could tell that she was less anxious when you visited her. Um, she was able to let down her guard a little bit. Uh, she admitted that she didn't know how to pray and that she'd get so stressed out. Um, but when we came around, she could pray. And so would we teach her to pray more and to pray by herself? And so it had this really wonderful moment, this really wonderful fruit. But more than that, this was an awesome opportunity for Laura because she could grow in humility, she could let go of a grudge, and she could persevere in this relationship that God was calling her to, even though she really didn't want to be in this relationship. And so eventually, she started, she enjoyed, she started to enjoy going to see her. And now we see her very regularly, and it's very wonderful. And Donna is a difficult person to love. And we all have people like this in our life, I think, these kind of people that are difficult. And she's difficult because, like, her faults are so apparent, and her attitude is so bad, and um, she's very ungrateful. And also lies. You know, lies can make it very unpleasant to love somebody. And I think things like lies and ungratefulness especially keep many people from getting to know the poor or helping the poor at all because, um, because they think, like, what's the point? If someone's lying to me, if someone's using to me, if they're ungrateful, well, what's the point? And here is the second test of faith. Because the question here is, do I believe in Donna's redemption? You know? Do I really believe that God loves these people that are so hard for me to love? That are so offensive to me? Um, can I even believe that he likes them? You know? Uh, can I believe that I can like them? Do I believe that even with all these flaws, that God still sees something good about them, and so I can see something good about them, and that I should try to see something good about them? And uh, do I believe that this person is, is even worthy of my time, even if they never change? So these are all things that, that, that question, that challenge our faith, um, and that consequently, you can't come up against any of these questions without thinking about them, without getting a little bit deeper, and without growing. So uh, the third point is that love for the poor builds faith. Um, I think it's very hard to see how God answers prayer in our life, right? Um, it often takes me a lot of reflection to see that God answered this prayer, that God did this, that, you know, God's been very good to me. Um, and even then, I still have all these doubts. One awesome thing about helping the poor is that if you ever doubt that God answers prayers, or if you ever doubt that God is still in the business of working miracles, then go help the poor. Because it's pretty easy to see, and it's, it's incredible. Uh, the Bible says that God hears the cry of the poor, um, and it is true. We uh, have this old woman who we know, who we met only a few months ago, and her favorite thing to do in the world is like sit on her stoop with her girlfriends, and carry on. And one afternoon I thought, well, I wonder if she needs groceries. I think I'll pack her up some. So I started doing this, but I was also afraid that it carried this presumption. Because if you just bring somebody groceries, it's like you're also saying, I bet you didn't have any food in the house, you know? And so I was worried about how that would come off if she'd be offended or anything. So. I did it anyway, and as I approached this little group that was sitting out on the stoop, I sort of explained myself ahead of time. I was like, now I know that you didn't ask for any of this stuff, but I brought you some groceries. And before I could even finish, they got wild and raucous laughter came out, and they said, ain't God good, ain't God good, ain't, God, ain't that the way God works? We were just sitting here wondering what we were going to do about food for the rest of the weekend, and then you came by like you heard us. Or something. <laughs> I was like, man, 
you know? That was a mind-blowing event, you know? Um, because there, there you go is a prayer answered just without my knowledge, completely, uh, completely without me even uh, doing anything, you know? Um, and uh, and it, it was awesome. Um, and the Bible says also that the poor have a lively faith, um, which is a good example to me. And it's a hard example to me also because the faith of the poor is often so lively that it seems foolish. Uh, their faith is so lively, I, I also want to counsel them against being so trusting. Like I want to uh, keep them from being disappointed if things don't work out. Like they have so much disappointment already, I kind of want to shelter them or something. But the poor know how to hope against hope. And it's really something I know that I can learn. Um, and this one mother that we know, Lenora, she's a mom of 13, and we met her about four years ago. And she's a mom who's been through a whole lot. I guess if you have 13 kids, that's, that's just a whole lot in and of itself. <laughs> um, but when we met her, she was fighting this unjust eviction, and uh, we helped her with this long, drawn-out court battle that lasted about a year and a half. And she was eventually evicted because one of her sons got arrested on the property. Um, which broke the settlement agreement that they had. And all of her sons, except the youngest, who's about nine, have been to jail already. We've moved them out of apartments, into hotels, into storage units. I've carried her couch here. I've carried her couch there, <laughs> you know. Um, they were homeless for a year also. And so we kept track of them at all these different family members' houses that they went to. And every family member eventually ended up kicking them out, or they burned that bridge somehow. One family member even um, moved right out from under her, left them squatting in an empty, abandoned apartment. Um, and throughout all these years, throughout all these movements, throughout all these problems, throughout all these difficulties, she would always pray with great faith for a place for her family, for a good home that was away from the city, which would bring the kids away from all the trouble that they get into, all the problems, all the violence, all the, the temptations that it entailed for them. And she would always also speak about this day that she would get this home away from the city, as though it was just around the corner, as though it was coming, you know, next week, as though there were just one more trial, there were just one more court case, there were just, um, you know, one more difficulty to get through, one more move. And he would always say, God didn't bring me this far to leave me. He didn't bring me this far to leave me. He's not going to leave me now. And I thought this was really nice, but I was also thinking, oh man, you're really positive. <laughs> but I don't know, you know, okay, we'll see, you know, being very cautious, you know. Um, and in December, her prayer was answered. And it was answered in a really interesting and weird way. Uh, and I think this must be God, because only God would do something like this. One of her sons, who had been in jail because he was witness to an accessory to a very violent crime, was about to get out. The youth program that was with him was so worried about him going back to his old neighborhoods, or even being in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, um, because of retaliation against him, uh, because he had testified against some friends, <clears throat> that they said, to her, you need to find a place for him to go. She said right back to them, you need to move me to West Virginia. And they did. No this, or there. this organization footed the bill for her entire move. They found her a house. They went with her to West Virginia four or five times house hunting. They packed up all the kids. They moved them under the cover of darkness so that nobody in the neighborhood knew that they were going. They put all their stuff in storage. They paid the storage fees. They did everything. Now she's living out in West Virginia, away from the city, and in this house, we have yet to see it. Um, and, you know, her prayer was answered in, in really a relatively short amount of time, only a few years, you know. Um, I thought she was going to endure this stuff in the city, for, you know, forever. Um, so, this is incredible. Praise God. And most times, when our faith gets built up, you know, um, we realize how weak our faith had been. And so helping the poor is a really excellent school of humility, which is very important. 
for a lively, for an active faith. <clears throat> and I hope that um, some of these stories and some of these things that we've learned um, are helpful or mean something. Um, and most of all, I just want to impart that God has a very special love for the poor. That's very personal and that's very intimate. And he invites us into this relationship with the poor, not because it's like a mere command, or not because it's an obligation, or not because we're going to be judged very harshly if we don't love the poor. Um, while all those things might be part of the idea, this relationship is life-giving more than anything else. And God has invited us to this relationship because he wants to show us something about himself. Because he's got something special and something new to do in our lives and to show us even in the least of the people around us. And so, because of this, there's always been a rich and a special relationship between the church and the poor, between the saints and the poor. And Pope Benedict, um, in his uh, first encyclical, Deus Caritas Est, said at the end of the encyclical that charity is one of the three constitutive elements of the church. That in the first century as the church spread, it became one of the three main ministries of the church. Love for widows, the sick, the poor, uh, the orphan, the prisoner. And he says that this is as essential to the mission of the church as the preaching of the word and the ministry of the sacraments. So it's one of three things that makes the church the church. And if we enter into this aspect of the church, there's no doubt that our faith is going to be enriched. Because we're living the life of the church more fully, we're living the life of God in us more fully, and we're encountering these new things when we meet Jesus, when we go to the poor. That's all I have to say. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about our ministry, you can um, go to our website, which is www.asimplehouse.org. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter, which comes four or five times a year, which basically is just more stories. So thanks very much. You can also sign up for the newsletter right there by signing that piece of paper. So, any questions? Yeah, I have a question. What do you recommend for, like, I'm on the street and I say like a bum on the street, I'm always very inclined not to give them any money because I'm always thinking, okay, they're probably addicted to drugs or alcohol. Like, what's your, what has been your perception of that? How true is that? You know, what would be the most effective way of helping somebody? But then you always get the guilt trip, you know, or it's like your buddy's in the city for the first time, he's like giving a dollar to everybody. It's like, I don't want to tell him not to do that, but yeah. I don't think it's a good idea. What, yeah. What I think... I think a lot of things about this. I always think about this. We had an experience the other night that I could talk about that I have so many thoughts about. Um, I think that if you give a dollar to a dude on the street, well, awesome, wonderful. Um, we never know what anybody's deal is, and we never know what they're going to do with that dollar. They might use it for drink or drugs or whatever, uh, but they might not. You know, um, I think it's sort of an important thing to kind of divorce ourselves from being in control of the help that we give. Um, because people have a terrible freedom that we also have. God gives us gifts that we can do with whatever we want. We can squander them. We have squandered them. I have squandered gifts. Um, we're free to squander gifts. And yet God loves and gives lavishly, you know. So there's a sense in which give freely, because we've been freely given to. Um, but I, I, I don't give out a lot of money on the street, uh, you know, myself. <laughs> um, partially because I don't have a lot of money to give. Um, uh, but, I, you know, I also think what there's so many good things that you can do for a person in need who's on the street. You can buy them a sandwich. You can say hello. You can shake their hand. You can tell them that you love them. You can tell them that God loves them. You know, all these things are so meaningful. Um, all these things are so wonderful. And um, the other night, we were walking down in the in the inner harbor, 
And this dude comes up to us and he says, oh, are you familiar with the area? And I say no. And he says, oh, I've got a story for you, basically. <laughs> you know, he's like, I'm from Battle Creek Mission and I'm trying to get to New York. And I got lost here and lost my bus ticket here. And this person jumped me and I got out of the hospital, see my bracelet, and this. And um, this was all probably a scam, you know, more than likely, 99%. And I just thought, I have $10, I can give you $10, no problem. Part of me was thinking, if this guy is working so hard to lie to me, just give him the money. <laughs> <laughs> the other part of me was thinking this, I'm not God. This guy comes to me, and who knows what sort of mess there is in his entire life. And you get two minutes with him where this mess is presented to you, and you have to make a choice. You could waste your two minutes by trying to decide everything about the person's mess, judge them, decide what's best, give them the hard word, knock them down, tell the police, you know, do whatever. You can respond in love. Um, you can say no, which is also a response that can happen in love. You know, you have all these loving responses. The thing for, you, for us is, like, what is the loving response? What is a loving response? Give it and be satisfied, you know? Um, because ultimately, that guy lied to me. If, I mean, if that guy lied to me, it's between him and God, you know? And I did what I could, and it's in, it's in God's hands now, you know? There's only so much that, that we can do. Uh, so we gotta like kind of step back from the, from the judge kind of chair and just kind of respond simply and lovingly, best we can, I think. That's best I figured out. I might have a different answer next week, so. <laughs> I was gonna say, I've had that same feeling. Like, you know, it's like, you, you almost don't wanna give know that, or you think that they're going to go buy um, alcohol. But my, I was talking to my sister about it, and she was like, you know what, I just give money anyway, just give it, just like you're saying, you know, it's between them and God. So um, I was in Baltimore a couple weeks ago, and I was walking, I saw this guy, and he asked me for some money, and uh, you know, I could tell that he'd been living on the streets. And so I gave him, I, I followed my sister's advice, and I gave him money. He was like, he was like, thank you, thank you. You have no idea how many people don't give. They, I'm, I'm really hungry. Like, I, you know, I want to eat. So many people don't give me food or don't give me money because they think I'm going to go buy booze and that kind of thing. And he just kept thanking me and thanking me and thanking me. And then I watched him go into Subway and, and get food. Most of that, so. St. Robert Bellarmine would say he would rather be taken advantage of or scammed 99 times than miss one authentic case. You know. I also think um, that this is kind of a problem of poverty, right? What do you say to the guy that approaches you? What do you say to the guy in the street? You know, whatever. Um, and that's only a small piece of the whole picture of poverty, right? Uh, one advantage of getting to know a person is be like, well, Joe uh, on the street, Joe who's lived on the street, dude, um, I know that you need this, so that you've got a wife and kids, and you need this, so put the drink away, you know? And he knows that you love him because you've gotten to know him, you've eaten a meal with him, you know? You've picked him up and taken him down to the Social Security office or something like this, you know? Um, so, by getting to know people and building a friendship, building a rapport, uh, you actually can get to this place where you know people really intimately and can address, like, real needs, you know? Uh, and really do it in friendship and really do it lovingly, you know? Um, and then there's no pressure, you know, this pressure of the two-minute interaction kind of goes away. I, <clears throat> I was really inspired by my youth group a few weeks ago. I work with high schoolers, and there's a conference out in Indianapolis, and as we were walking to a restaurant, we just passed by tons of homeless people all through the street, asking for money and everything, and my youth group, all these high schoolers were like, we want to get them something to eat, and then we want to go talk to them. Okay, you know, I can't remember that. So they got this lady something to eat, and you know, and that, oh, that's already just one other option is go get some food. But then they wanted to talk to the person, and immediately she started talking, and we could already tell a lot of her stories weren't matching up, like they weren't making sense together, and so there's some. Seemed like there's some lies kind of weaved in there, and we're like, like what's going on? <laughs> you know, and um, and she already admitted to us that she she drinks a lot and that she's been arrested on the street for being just drunk on the street and everything. Um, 
but then, as we kept talking to her, um, she told us how she's been kicked out of you know, her own daughter's home. And that in the end, all she wants is a blanket and somebody to pray with her. She said, that's, all, that's all I want. So my high schoolers held her hand and they prayed with her. And then they went out to a store, bought her a blanket, and they gave her all, you know, all of them gave her this big hug and she just started crying instantly with these hugs. And um, and she said, I haven't felt somebody hug me in a really long time. And, uh, and she thanked us for the blanket. And that was the end of it. You know, like I don't know where she is now, but in that moment, I think just what you were saying, so many people like without hope that feel unlovable because maybe their own family has thrown them away, you know, and, and here in this moment she was just crying and she felt loved. And um, so I think even like you said, just going up and, and just shaking their hand and if you buy them a sub, like buy yourself one too and eat it with them, you know, and just be like, hey, what's your name? And then, like and shake their hand and say like, cool, see you later. You know, just have that little moment of interaction. Absolutely. That's awesome. I think there's a thing like, um, like, it's like you want to have like a policy or something. Like for a while, I was like, I'm always going to give money to homeless people. So, but then I realized that that just always wasn't a good idea. Like there are times when it's a good idea to decide I shouldn't give this person money or something. So then it's like, well, I'm never going to give a homeless person money, and that's not right either. And just realizing that there's like a person and a specific situation there, and you don't. Always have time to stop, you know, and eat a sub with someone, or you don't. But there is always like a loving response that you can have to someone, and that could be giving them a hug. It could be just saying, "Hey, sorry, but I hope you have a good night. God bless you, and whatever." Um, or it could be, you know, eating a sub with, you know, whatever. But just realizing that it's like always a specific kind of. There's a, a person there that requires a good response. I remember once I was in a room and um, keep in mind in Rome you wear fanny packs and keep your hand <laughs> open slippers. <laughs> um, because um, uh, pickpocketing there is kind of like car theft in New York. It's a sport. Um, but anyway, it was a I remember passing in a tunnel and I just handed a homeless person a pop tart, which, you know, I do it, which isn't much, it's not money, I had a bag of some American food before I left because I knew I would be walking around a lot. And this person's face just lit up because they had something to eat. If you give them a dollar, there's a uh, a homeless person, a dollar, you know, they might buy food, they might buy uh, boots, you don't know. If you give them food, they're, uh, especially cheap food, they're probably going to eat it. Which, um, that, because I remember reading a book where this woman had grew up in a you know, family where both of her parents were drug addicts, um, when, and, you know, her mom. Uh, sold the Thanksgiving turkey for five bucks so she could get a cocaine hit. So expensive food, not as much, but cheap food that uh, that they're going to eat or they're going to throw with. So. Yep. I was going to ask, are there any ministries in the Baltimore area that like you want to get involved uh, with the poor? Are there any ministries in downtown Baltimore that you recommend? I have no idea because we <laughs> are um, in D.C., <laughs> so I really, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I bet, I bet there's some good ones, yeah, sure. I know a few. There's like Gifts of Hope, which is Nate's hospice for, our, well, Mother Teresa does uh, run it on your Ben Hopkins. There's also a, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a source where they deliver food and some of the to the homeless. There's so Vincent de Paul. They down in um, downtown Baltimore. There, the parish center, basically the parks next to them, is now a homeless shelter, essentially a tent camp. During so there's a lot of service to the poor out of Vincent de Paul. Okay, Vincent de Paul's a, a parish down there. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's down near City Hall in that area. Related to this, I think I can try to look around, see what there is in Baltimore. And I'll put something on our Facebook page, like put a list of resources, yeah, awesome. information for Simple House, other things in the area. So I'll get that together in the next couple of days. But give, just another mention of Gift of Hope. Um, they are mainly an AIDS hospice. It's, hospice. it's a pretty small operation, only 10 beds. But they do do food distributions for holidays, different times of the year. So they need help with those and neighborhood outreach as well. They do an after school program. They have a summer camp in the, for two weeks and I think July into August for neighborhood kids, that sort of thing. And kind of related to, I thought this is just as random fact, but I thought it was interesting. When they do the food distribution, they always buy the cheap brand, the generic brand canned foods, because if they buy the expensive canned foods, those have street street value, and they get sold again. So, <laughs> so they're trying to, like, they'll buy the Safeway soup instead of Campbell's or whatever. But even that. Thank you.